Hey guys, good morning. Welcome. We are so glad you've joined us this morning. I'm Lindley. This is James, and we're here at IBC Corbin, and we are pumped that you've joined us online this morning. Definitely. And while you're here, and before we get started, go ahead and share this link. Um, do a watch party. Yep. Um, you can figure that out. I'm not sure the exact clicks to do it. Yep. James is pretty good at it, but um, go ahead and share it and let your friends know that you're watching with us this morning. It can encourage them to yeah. join us as well. For sure. It's a great way to kick off. Also, We're, go ahead and comment. Yeah, let us know you're here. We've got people ready to respond to your comments um, and reach out and connect with you. If you have prayer, if, if you have prayer, if you need prayer for anything, we have people ready to pray for you and walk with you through whatever that situation is. So you can just comment the word prayer and we'll be praying for you. Yeah. Or you can direct message us and we'll reach out and connect with you that way. Yes, there's online hosts waiting to just answer your needs. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions throughout the service today, um, feel free to just put those on the comment box. Yep. So it's getting pretty chilly this morning. Very. Uh, <laughs> so that means that Tri-County Christmas is coming up. That's going to be December 11th. It's a really cool event. Uh, it's only December 11th this year, so yes, in the past day. it's been multiple days. Yeah. But Mark your calendar. One day only, Tri-County Christmas. Um, and we need volunteers for that. There's a ton of different um, areas to serve because of how big the event is. There's yeah. lots, of, lots of different stations and tasks that need to be done. So um, hop on the We Are IBC app. What does the yes. app look like? It is the blue app with the white sheet. Yep. Um, go ahead and download that first thing because we will be talking a little bit more about how you mm -hmm. can use that as a resource. Yep. Um, and that is, like James said, to sign up for Tri-County Tri Christmas. Get on there and just click serve. If you don't know exactly what you would want to do, yeah. you can just submit your your like information and someone would get back with you yeah. and see what things you're interested in or what things we just need help with. Yeah. Um, but the gospel for will sure. be shared. There'll be Christmas lights, for hot sure. chocolate, yeah. ice in the back. Yeah. You don't want to miss it. Definitely. Um, something else that's coming up is Upward. Yep. Um, it's coming back this year. Basketball and cheerleading. It's K, K5 K through 8th grade. Yes. <laughs> um, and the evals are this week. So it's on Tuesday and Thursday yep. here at IBC Corbin. Um, you want to make sure you're registered and then you'll get forwarded that information for yep. those ev evals. Yep. That's from 530 to 830, but you can yes. find all that information on the app or our on website. Um, so go there and fill out all your paperwork so you can Get your head in the game as soon as you get here. Yes. Um, so coming in 2022, we've got a ton of missions trips yes. coming up that I'll let you talk about in a second. Yeah, but so many. Over the week of Thanksgiving, which is super soon, we've got a team going to Mexico. So um, be sure to be praying for them, partner with them in prayer. Absolutely. Um, if you want to partner financially to help uh, get anyone through their fundraising goal before they go on the trip, that would be great. You can find information about that on the app. They're going to go to Mexico and put on a vacation Bible school, I think, yeah. for the missionaries family so their children will get to be encouraged by our staff as they go um, and encourage them in their sharing of the gospel to Absolutely. all the nations. And here at Emmanuel we believe that everyone has a next step and if your next step is missions mm -hmm. and we've got some awesome trips coming up next year 2022 yeah. um, we've got some in Dean which is in our yeah, backyard right. so here in Kentucky then we're going all the way to Serbia England New Orleans Asia and so many more mm -hmm. so if you have a heart for missions and we, you believe that your next step is taking a mission trip yeah download the app get on yeah. there and you can find so much more information mm -hmm. so you can find those already on the app and start scheduling out planning your vacation for next Absolutely. year so that you can arrange um, your schedule to work with God's mission uh, which is really cool and the amount of place we have to go is awesome yeah. you have opportunities whether you have a lot of time to go or just a couple days you can make it fit into your schedule um, and next sunday we have communion yes, so communion. be sure to come in person to whatever campus is closest to you um, and join us in that we're yes. so glad that you're here um, stand when we stand pray when we pray worship with us good morning welcome to emmanuel baptist church let's all stand together and worship the lord Walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high line, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven and I've never been the same yeah. I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love 
Sting of the fire, but I saw you in the flame. Just when I thought it was over, you broke me out of the grave. Hallelujah! I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. I found the word of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. Yeah. Oh, I am a child of love. Yeah. Oh, I am a child of love. Nothing can change. Romans chapter 8, it says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is nobody. Nobody, church. It's amazing the love that God has for every single one of us. And so who wouldn't want to take next steps with Jesus? There's a card right in front of you, the Connect card. Fill that out during a part of the service. Drop it in the bucket as we leave. Man, let's continue to sing. Let's continue to lift up the name of Christ. Oh, there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. Oh, there's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy, you are worthy. Oh, there's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy, you are worthy. Oh, there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. No heart or death can separate. Your steadfast love can't escape. 
your faithfulness and endless peace. So full of grace and mercy, we sing God is so Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
that we as a church stand upon the truth of scripture that every time whenever you come into this place what you can expect is that we're going to preach from God's word it's been like that for a very very long time a group of people devoted to the truth of scripture and you can expect that every single time we're going to use God's word and here's why because it reveals the truth about who God is and we want to match God. We want to be like God. We want to follow God. We want to be where He is. And that's something that we can build our lives upon. And so as we pray, 
I just want to, all of us together, w- w- this is a group activity that we would pray. Let's pray and ask God that he would open our eyes and our ears, that we, he might reveal and that we might see and that we might hear who he is in the truth of scripture, and then know how it is that we can change to be more like him. That's what we're going to do. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for today, grateful for the opportunity to hear from your word. God, that is something that we can build our lives upon. I'm thankful that Jesus is the perfect embodiment of truth and love. He didn't just run around telling everybody what was true because it was true, but instead he told them what was true because he loves them. God, I'm thankful that you sent Jesus the word, who is every, he is the embodiment of every single word you wanted to say to us in a person. I'm thankful. Thankful for the fact that he cleansed us of our sins and has made a way for us to be with you forever in heaven. God, help us as we open your scriptures today, God, to focus and to hear from you. It's in your powerful name that we pray. It's in your name that we sing. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Hey, good morning, Emmanuel Baptist. Good to be with y'all today. My name's Chad. Um, glad to be back here in Corbin with you. Definitely want to give a shout out to all the folks online this morning who are watching, as well as say hey to my friends in Richmond. Definitely got to give a big shout out to all my people in Williamsburg. What's up, y'all? And uh, miss y'all this morning. Love you guys. Can't wait to be back with you soon. Anyway, let me start us off this morning with a question. Here's our question for the day and how we're going to get started Have you ever experienced false hope? Have you ever experienced false hope? Let me give you a definition, and my guess is you're going to say yes after I give you this definition, if you haven't already said yes. False hope is someone telling you what you want to hear when you're struggling. It's somebody telling you what you want to hear when things are falling apart, when life is difficult, when you're suffering. Many of you, probably all of you are saying, yeah, I've heard some false hope before. Well, on a lighter note, uh, I've experienced some struggles, some some difficulties in my life being an NC State University basketball fan. I know y'all can't relate to this here in Kentucky, but it's a difficult life for us. I've got two degrees from that place. I got a lot invested in it, 
and man, we're terrible. We've got two national championships. If you didn't know that, you probably don't know that because all you know about is the Tar Heels and the Blue Devils in North Carolina where I'm from. But we used to be really good. But every year, I get this ridiculous false hope from all these people telling us, this is the year, man. We're going to be good again. The cardiac pack is back. And we're always terrible. It's just false hope after false hope constantly. But the best we can do is ruin the Tar Heels or the Blue Devil season every now and then. That's about all we can do. We're mediocre all the time. You know, to be quite honest, I'm at the point where I've got more faith and hope that my, the intramural team at my seminary is going to win the national championship in the future. I mean, just to be honest with you. But nonetheless, the struggle is real. Let me be a little more serious, though, and let's talk about struggle. Let's talk about hopelessness. Let's talk about suffering with regards to being a Christian. We can definitely say that we have experienced that, I'm sure, in our lives and in this room. And so, so often, we buy into false hopes during these types of times. We're vulnerable to it. When we're suffering, we're, we're struggling, when things are kind of falling apart, we are more prone to listen to and believe in things that aren't true, that really just kind of tell us what we want to hear. And unfortunately, those things are often packaged in Christian language and even Bible verses. We're in the reading plan right now in the Old Testament. I hope you're doing it. I have been really challenged by it. But we just finished up in the book of Jeremiah. And that's where we're going to land today. And we're going to land on a verse today that unfortunately has been used to project false hope within so many Christians today. It's an incredible verse, and some of you might know where I'm going with this. And so I want to read it for us. It's actually Jeremiah 29, verse 11. If you know this, you could probably just say it along with me, but let me read it for those who don't know this verse. It says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Maybe you've heard that verse before. If you've been in church a while, you probably have. Many Christians have that one memorized. And it is an important verse. And memorized scripture, that's good. But so many, that's one they have memorized. Some, I mean, even have it hanging up in their house. They've bought a sign from like Hobby Lobby or somewhere, got a beautiful frame, and it's kind of hung up in the kitchen or over the toilet or wherever you got those signs, right? You might have it there. I mean, some people, uh, you know, actually have it like on their profile on Instagram or Facebook or something like that. That's their life verse. Believe it or not, people even have it tattooed on their bodies. So Jeremiah 29, 11 is a very popular verse here in America. And it sounds really great, but what does it actually promise? What does it actually say? I'm afraid there's been a, a major misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of it here in America. Because there's been the promotion with this verse that if you're a Christian, God wants you to have an easy life that's problem-free where nothing bad will probably ever happen to you. And a lot of people hang on to that verse almost like it's magic, like that's going to happen. And that's something when we're struggling especially, when difficult times abound that we might grab onto. Friends, today, I, I don't know about you, but, but these are kind of crazy times. Things are quite uncertain. We want things to go back to the way that they were. But also, we're experiencing some difficulties, some hopelessness, some struggle per se, from a lot of other things going on. Like, I don't know, the moral decay that's all around us right now. It's hard to watch. Seeing all the things that are going on, right? Feels a little bit hopeless. We can also feel it too from just the persecution that's starting to grow. There's a lot of people who don't like us as Christians. They really don't like what we have to say, and they sure don't like to uh, hear what God has to say from his word. And so that's growing rapidly in our culture. In times like right now, we can have a sense of hopelessness. Well, ironically, there was the same sense of hopelessness believing in some false hopes as well with the original audience to whom that verse was written. They were suffering in exile out of their homeland, and it was not easy living. And like them, today, so many 
are trusting in false hopes that sound like they're from God because they don't actually understand God's true plans from his word. And so this morning, we're going to get into verse 11. We're going to unpack it, but we're going to actually study it in the context of where it lies. And that's verses 4 through 14. And we'll get into that in a moment. But let me get you into the book of Jeremiah for just a minute. I don't have enough time to go through all of it, but let's just get acclimated for a moment. Now, Jeremiah is considered one of the major prophets. He had a ministry of about 40 years, so he was around a really long time, and it was during a, a pretty crazy time in Jerusalem. But I will tell you this about Jeremiah. He was not a popular prophet nor a, pro, a popular preacher. People didn't like him. And the reason they didn't like him was because he preached messages of destruction and judgment. Now, when you're in a hard time, that surely isn't what you want to hear, and that's not what they wanted to hear too. But Jeremiah was going to tell them the truth. There were lots of other people during that day and time telling them that God was going to bless them even though they were disobedient. God was going to bless them even though they were unfaithful to the covenant that he made with them. He refused to do that. He was not going to tell them what they wanted to hear. He knew they were hopeless, but he was going to tell them the truth. So what he does here is he writes them a letter to these folks that are in exile in Babylon who just want to go home. And he gives them a message of true hope. They cannot have to listen to these false hopes anymore because there's a true hope that's there. And so we're going to see in this verse as well as in this whole, whole passage that there was a hope for them and there's a hope for us too in hopeless times. But we need to ask ourselves the question today. What should be our true hope? And have we been building that hope correctly? Let me pray for us and then we'll get into the text. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for the Old Testament as how we've gone through it this uh, whole year of 2021. It's been powerful. It's been life-changing for me. God, thank you for the study of this passage, which has been super convicting. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak not only to me, but to others in this room today. God, that we would hear your voice and we would respond appropriately. Let these be your words and not my words. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you use our app and you take notes, I'd encourage you to do that today. If not, grab one of those pins in front of your chair and take notes of this. Because what we're going to see today in Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 14 are three truths we must believe when we are feeling hopeless. Three truths. Number one, if you're taking note of this, write this down. Believers must avoid false hopes from false prophets when things seem hopeless. Let's see how that plays out in verses 4 through 9 in the text. Let me read that beginning in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Believers must avoid false hopes from false prophets when things seem hopeless. Now what we have to see here in these first few verses is this. It's the Lord that has sent them into exile. It's not just because the Babylonians have come on their own volition and grabbed them out. And taken them to this foreign land out of their home country. No. God promised this before they ever went into the promised land. In the book of Deuteronomy he says, If you break my covenant, if you worship idols... I will send you into exile, into foreign lands. 
God is following through on his promise here. But the real problem at hand is, and what Jeremiah is confronting and God's telling him to do is, there are these false prophets that were saying they were speaking for God, but they were not. What were these false prophets doing? They said that this exile that these people were experiencing was going to be really short. It'd be over in no time. And so what they were trying to do was to speed up God's plans as well as his purposes. And this is advantageous to them. Why would they do that? Why would they tell these people what they wanted to hear when they were suffering? Potentially knowing that really wasn't God's plan. Well, they had something to gain. See, false prophets do this. They tell people what they want to hear because they want to be popular. And why do they want to be popular? So they might have a platform. So they might have power. And they might even get money out of this. So they're telling these people what they want to hear in suffering. And Jeremiah says, do not listen to them. This is what God is saying. Instead, get comfortable. Settle down. You're going to be there a while. Go ahead and make a life there and live it out. Oh, by the way, avoid rebellion. I don't want you going against these people because they're from me. You're enslaved there, essentially. You're, you're, ca- you're captive there. You're going to stay in that. You're going to park in that, and you're not going to defy them. Oh, by the way, I want you to pray for them. So as they're blessed, you're going to be blessed. Don't listen to these false prophets that tell you anything else besides that. Do not listen to them. That's what Jeremiah says to them. you got to put yourself in their sandals for a moment. Like, this is tough stuff to hear. You've been ripped out of your home. You just want to go home. You just want things to go back to normal. And what Jeremiah is telling them is, nope, get comfortable. Most of these people, this is the even harder part, and we're going to see this in the next verse, most of these people would never see the promised land again because this was going to be a lot longer exile than what these false prophets were telling them. And that was very, very sobering. Now listen, if we fast forward towards the New Testament, we will see that in this book, over and over and over and over and over again in the New Testament, there is warnings of false prophets, false teachers telling us false hopes and to watch out. This is something God's people have always had to be concerned with. And through 2,000 years of church history, we can see it too. The New Testament writer uh, often says this, that uh, Paul tells Timothy, watch out, people want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. That's basically, false teachers are always going to tell people what they want to hear. So in New Testament times and in modern times today, we have to watch out for these same things. I could go on for hours telling you about false hopes from false prophets that we have today. But we don't have that kind of time. So I want to bring out three that are very prominent in our culture today that are very subtle. And you can see why that maybe they are happening in times like these that are quite difficult where we might have some hopelessness. The first one is called the prosperity gospel. Some of you have heard that preached about here or maybe you know something about that. But the prosperity gospel loves to hang its hat actually on Jeremiah 29 11. It's not the only verse, but it's an important one. And it basically says this, that if you're a Christian, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be healthy. God wants everything in your life to be good. And if it's not, you're doing something wrong because that's God's will for your life. That's the prosperity gospel. That's a false hope that's just not true. There's another one out there, and you may not know this one, but I'll call it cheap grace. And there's a cheap grace gospel that's being preached ever so more prominently these days, that basically says if you made some sort of decision to be a Christian, that God's forgiven you and you can live your life however you want. You can do whatever you want. You can sin however you want. It doesn't really matter. You do you. You be you. That is being proposed this day. And it sounds awfully Christian, but it's not. One other one that's very prominent today is what we would call universalism. It's this idea that if God really did love everybody, if God was really fair, if Jesus really did die for the sins of the whole world, 
then I, you know what? Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, everybody in the end is going to go to heaven. Everybody will be saved in the end. Those are three false hopes that are out there these days that Christians oftentimes fall victim to, and we have to watch out. And the reality of it is they sound great. I mean, who in here don't want to be rich? I do. I mean, I mean, we want that. I want, to, I want to live a long time, have a great, long, healthy life. I want everybody to love me. I want everything to be great. I want to, hey, I can give my life to Jesus and live however I want. That sounds awesome. You know, of course I want to do that. And, oh, I don't have to do any evangelism because all my friends are just going to be saved no matter what they believe. All those things sound really good, but they're not biblical. And when we're in our low point, when we're struggling, when, when we're hopeless feeling at times, those things seem to creep in ever so quickly. They tell us what we want to hear in challenging times. In the words of the Lord, through the prophet Jeremiah, I want to remind us of this. These are lies. Do not listen to them. We are meant to be exploited by these things because these people who have ripped Scripture out of context and added some Christian cliches and some different things onto their ideologies, they have something to gain by telling us what we want to hear. Position, power, and of course money. So we have to be very careful during these times. The principle for the people in that day and the principle for us today as well is this. False hope in difficult times derives from ignorance to and impatience with God's true plan. Number two, take note of this. Believers must listen to God's word when things seem hopeless. Let's read verse 11, but also with verse 10 here, and let's see how the story continues. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Believers must listen to God's word when things seem hopeless. See, there's some resentment and loss of confidence in God because of this suffering that they are experiencing in exile. They're starting to wonder what's going on. But what he says right here is so important. If they don't avoid the false hopes from these false prophets, they'll actually miss God's true plans. There's some important words right here at the beginning of verse 10. This is, For thus says the Lord. Anytime you see those words, thus says the Lord, you should take notice. Because those are the word of God. That is God's word. And what he says, his word to them is this. They need to thrive in exile. Why? To be prepared for future deliverance in 70 years. I imagine a lot of people are not getting that one tattooed on their arm. 70 years of exile and suffering, right? But that's what is is being said here. They need to be prepared for this future deliverance. That's why they need to thrive there. See, they deserved destruction for their sin. They deserved God's wrath and punishment. But he is a good and loving God who has shown them mercy and will continue to show them mercy even though they're being disciplined. By his word, he provides promise of a future hope that's meant to motivate them in tough times. They're not going to make it out of this exile, but they can be getting things ready for a future deliverance. If you don't hear anything else about verse 11 and about this whole passage, listen to this. It's very important. God doesn't tell them that their life's going to be easy, but what he does tell them is he will be with them through their suffering and exile. That's what he tells them here. So they can't lose hope because of their circumstances, because they just want things to go back the way they were. They just want to go home. No, they have to trust his word. They have to trust what he has said. We fast forward to today. We hate to suffer, don't we? I mean, I don't think anybody in human history has enjoyed suffering. I hope not. But man, I got to tell you, like our generations today, whew. We do almost anything and everything we can for comfort, 
and for ease. I mean, just look at us. We, we walk out of the house in sweatpants all the time. We just want to be comfortable all the time. I teach college students. That's how they come to class. But, but we're always kind of pursuing things. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's technology, educations, relationships, anything we're doing, we're really pursuing comfort and ease. And the real question that we have to ask is, is that pursuit of comfort and ease, of building our life on some of these false hopes that are out there, is that really what God's word says? Or is that building our life on the American dream with a little bit of Christianity sprinkled in? Are we building our life with future hopes of jobs and relationships and, and friendships and different things and financial situations based on God's word or about what the culture around us tells us. See, it's easy to want comfort and ease, but if you're a follower of Jesus, I've got some news for you today. This is an important news flash. That's not what you signed up for. Read the New Testament. Read the gospel accounts. Read the epistles. Like, like that's not what you signed up for. You are following your Lord and Master who suffered for you, and you are called to a life of suffering as well. It's going to be hard. The world's going to hate you. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to fit in. In many ways, you might feel like an exile in this world. But here's the good news. Here's the promise. Here's the hope. Jesus promises to be with us always as we do suffer as we do identify with him. He says it in the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and is with us as we struggle, as we suffer, and that's a promise we can hold on to. Jesus will see us through our suffering, whether it's in self-inflicted wound because of our sin or because of how the world hates him and hates us as a result. He will be with us. This is why we have to be very careful how we read the Bible. That we might not misinterpret a verse like verse 11 where we believe that we're supposed to have some sort of easy life. Now you're called to Christ likeness. And if Christ suffered, then you've got to expect that that's going to be a part of your life as well. But the good news is he will be with you always through every bit of it. That's an even greater hope than any kind of easy life there might be on planet earth. So the principle for them and the principle for us is this. Only correct understanding of God's word can give us assurance of future hope in difficult times. Only that. Only correct understanding of his word. Number three, believers must turn back to the Lord who is their true hope when things seem hopeless. When things seem hopeless, we must turn back to the Lord. He's the true hope. Let's see this finish up in verses 12 through 14. Then you will call upon me and pray and come to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. There's another important word we want to make sure we see here, and it's the word then. This word then pops up in verse 12. That's a conjunction. It connects two thoughts together. And what it's saying is this. Then, after listening to my word, what I have said, here's what you need to know. Your true hope is only in me. Their true hope as exiles was only to come by making the Lord their only hope. See, their suffering, watch this, this is so important. Their suffering was meant to draw these exiles back into intimacy with the Lord. That was the point of it. His discipline was meant to restore them, not just to their land, not to the land that we were promised. Watch this. It was meant to restore them also back to himself. That was what it was for. Just to show you how gracious and merciful and loving God is, he continues on with this. If you move through the book of Jeremiah, just two chapters more ahead in Jeremiah 31, he says this, I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. 
one that's going to be written on your hearts, where sin is forever forgiven. This is a foreshadowing of the new covenant that Jesus established in the upper room with his disciples at the Last Supper, and he accomplished with his death on the cross for sinners. This is the plan. This is the welfare. This is the future. This is the hope. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Their short-term suffering in that moment was for a purpose. Because there was a greater deliverance coming, even more than the land. They were going to one day be delivered from sin itself. Now, I probably should have let this cat out of the bag a little bit earlier. So I'm going to let it out now. Jeremiah 29, 11, well, all of this is not written to us. I mean, we're not Jews living in exile in Babylon. I mean, we're not. So specifically, this is not meant for us. God's word is meant for us. It's written for us. But the specific promise here is actually not even written for us. But verse 11 then comes to even greater life. As those who have been born again, we actually see the real hope. We see the true hope. We see the amazing meaning of it that is so much more than this easy life that people are peddling to us with this verse. We have been given eternal life in Christ. We already have it. It's your possession already. But you also have a hope of a better promised land, a future promised land. It's called heaven. And there'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more exile. There'll be no more sickness. And there'll be no more death. And you will get to be with God forever. The one true hope, God, you get to be with him forever. That's the greatest reward ever. So our intimacy with him that we have of turning back to him is so important. It's something that we must do. We call that faith and repentance. Those are the words that we use. So the principle that we see here for them and the principle for us today is this. God calls his people to repentance and faith in Christ as the only source of hope in difficult times. He's the only source of hope that we must have. So when things seem hopeless, we must avoid false hopes from false prophets. When things seem hopeless, we must listen to God's word and his word alone. And when things seem hopeless, we must turn back to the Lord because he is our true hope and our only hope. Knowing these truths as born again believers, we have to ask ourselves the question, what must we now do? What are some practical application points that we can consider? Here at Emmanuel, we say, what's our next steps, right? So what should we do with this? Well, let me tell you what you probably don't need to do first. You don't necessarily need to go redecorate your house. Okay, Keep, keep the sign up. It's cool. Um, it, you, you know more about it right now. Like, like, leave it up. It's cool. You know it. You understand the fuller picture there. And keep shopping at Hobby Lobby. We need you to support Christian businesses, all right? So keep doing that. You don't need to necessarily change your profile on Instagram or Facebook, whatever generation you're from. You don't necessarily need to do that. You know this greater hope that you have because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you don't necessarily need to go schedule an appointment at the tattoo parlor. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Know that that might even be a tool for witnessing to others. So we have the bigger picture here now. What must we do in all seriousness? Number one, take note of this. Be careful who you listen to and in what you put your hope. Be careful who you listen to and in what you put your hope. Friends, today, there is such easy access to these charlatans out there who are telling us a bunch of stuff that sounds Christian that's not. These are hard times. We just want things to go back to normal. But do not listen to these people. They are lies that they are spreading. They are false hopes be careful what you're listening to and to what you put your hope i had an exercise in seminary that really helped me to understand this our professor gave us a book said read it come to class we'll have a discussion about it we all did we're like oh this book's great it's awesome he's like did you actually learn anything about the author on that no 
Did you read any endorsements in the book? No. He's like, okay, well, you should be really concerned because this isn't true. I just, I just fooled you guys. We're like, oh, my goodness. And it sounded really good. So be careful. It can happen so easily. Even to people who are very serious about the things of the Lord, be careful who you listen to and to where you put your hope. Number two, derive your hopes and dreams from God's word alone. God's word alone. This book has what you need. Now, it's gonna, not going to tell you exactly the, the specific person you need to marry. It's not going to tell you exactly what your job should be. It's not going to tell you how much money you're going to make specifically, where you should live. But it gives us the principles that we need to build true hopes and hopes that God has given. The things that he has said in his word. You can't build it on the American dream. You can't build it on your comfort and ease. You've got to read it out of the Bible. Are you building your life on your plans and just asking God to bless them? Or are you building them on the plans from his word, the Bible? Friends, we need a reformation today. And we need a reformation today for this. We've got to have churches full of people that know what this book actually says. Not building their life off of Christian cliches and sound bites and scriptures ripped out of context. No, you need to know what this says. I hope today that's a wake-up call for you. Every time I study this, I'm humbled by it, and I, but I want more and more. We've got to get serious about reading God's word and knowing what he's actually said so we're not deceived. And that leads to the third and final application point. Make repentance and faith in Christ a daily lifestyle. That's not something you just did once when you gave your life to Christ. That is something you are called to each and every single day. Turn back to the Lord. When times are hard and you are struggling, turn back to him. I know you, you, you may have a hard time believing this if you've never experienced it. But there can actually be joy in suffering. There can actually be joy in suffering. Because if you turn back to the Lord and you spend more time with him and your intimacy with him grows, that is the sweetest fellowship you will ever have. Your life might be falling apart, but God's in control and you are with him. And it can be an amazing, amazing time. I've seen it in my own life. I can mark the different moments where I've turned to him in difficult times and where I haven't. And I can promise you those were joyful times there even though they were hard. Turn back to the Lord. Don't turn away from him. We now have a fuller picture. We now understand this verse in context. And we now see that we have a greater hope. So when you get the report from the doctor that looks fairly ominous, and things don't look good. When the pink slip lands on your desk at work, and you lose your job, when you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, trying to witness to your family members, and they tell you you're an idiot, or when the consequences of your sin unfortunately finally catch up with you. You can have a future hope knowing that Jesus will be with you always through that suffering. He's never going to leave you. That's the promise that you've got to hold on to. And even better still, you will one day get to be in heaven with God himself where there is no sin, where there is no suffering, where there is no death, where there is no tears, where there is no disease. That is such a better hope than just an easy and comfortable life here on earth. And I want to challenge us today to press into that. I've got to believe in a room this size that there's people in here, I'm talking to you, and you would not identify yourself as a Christian. You have not put your trust in Christ for your salvation. Maybe you recognize today that you have no hope. I'll tell you the truth. You don't. You don't have any hope. You have all there is in this life. That's it. You're right. You have no hope. And I'll tell you an even scarier thought than that. Not only do you have no hope, 
But we're not just talking about a 70-year exile here. We're talking about exile from God for eternity. From him and his goodness, that is not something that you want. So I'm pleading with you today. If you have never repented of your sin, if you have never put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ to save you from your sins so you can be in right relationship with God, I beg you today, I plead with you today, turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ. And you'll have the greatest hope that you've ever known. I want to pray for us right now. And as we move into a time of worship and response, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit just works in our hearts in this moment. Don't be disobedient to what God's calling you to do. Y'all, I've been wrecked putting this sermon together. God dealt with me well before I came in here. And I'm sure he's doing the same with you as well. So what's your next step? Is it salvation? Is it finally surrendering? Do it today. Is it baptism? Is it becoming an owner? Is it surrendering to the call of ministry? Is it serving? I don't know what it is. But let's be obedient to what God is calling us to do today. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for how you have dealt with me in your word. That it's so often in my life, when things are hard, my tendency is to build my hopes and my dreams on things that are even of my own concoction or what others have said, and they're not really from your word. I haven't put my hope and my faith and my trust in you. You are my only hope. Forgive me for that this morning. But I pray for these people in this place, whether online or at our other campuses, God, that we'd be stirred up to what you're doing in our life, that we would take next steps, that we would faithfully respond, that we might come to this altar today and just repent and say we're sorry. God, would you move in our hearts this morning? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Search the world for a love that can fill my heart, but nothing compares to the wonder of who you are. Holy, all the earth singing, holy, all the angels cry, holy, Jesus.
shed your blood for salvation. You broke the curse for our freedom. You rose from death with the morning. You'll come again. Amen. Let's hear it. Let's hear it, y'all. Amen. Praise God for his word. Thankful for this worship team. Hey, just a couple things before we leave. I want to encourage you to fill out that card that I mentioned just during the beginning of the service. You can drop that in your tithe in the bin as you leave the building. And also, we've got a Mexico mission team that's going to be leaving, not this week, but next week. But we want to get ahead of the game and pray. And also, if, if somebody, if you feel led to give for this Mexico mission team, you can go ahead and drop that in the bin as well. But these guys, there's, they've been preparing. They're getting ready to put on this incredible vacation Bible school and student ministry event for missionaries' families that are coming for a retreat. And uh, I bet most of us in this room, we would love to have a, a type of retreat like that. But many of these missionaries have been facing some great difficulties, and so our team's going to be coming alongside and just encouraging them. It's going to be a really great time. Another thing that's happening here at Emmanuel this week is upward sign-ups. Our Tuesday and Thursday, 5.30 through 8.30, basically your kid's going to show up, be ready to play a little bit, play some basketball. You're going to be experiencing that together. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you need some more information, you can go by the Next Steps station. Wednesday night, for those that are ready to put on Tri-County Christmas, we're going to show up right here at 7.30. Man, Dollywood has got nothing on Christmas when it comes to Emmanuel, right? That's what we're going to do. We're going to try to basically take all the folks that are going to Dollywood. They're going to want to be here. Dollywood's going to kind of take a little dip in attendance maybe that weekend. Tri-County Christmas is going to be December 11th. It's going to be a lot of fun. But if you want to be a part of the dream team that puts on that event, man, we need your help. There's a role for you to play. 7.30 right here on Wednesday night is a place where you want to be. Parent commissioning. This is my last thing. Parent commissioning is kind of like what other churches would say, baby dedication. If you want to dedicate your child to the Lord, here at Emmanuel, we kind of view this more so as a parent's commitment that they're making to the Lord to raise their child up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. If you want to be a part of that, that's going to be November 28th, but we need you to go ahead and fill out that form that's on the app. 
And if, if you don't have the app, if you'll go by the Next Step station, they'll kind of help you figure out how to do that. But we'll need some pictures and some other information from you as well. Father, we just come to you and we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We're thankful that your word is like honey on our lips. It's better. It's, it's incredible. We pray that you'd help us to repent and believe every single day this week because of your word having incredible impact within our heart as we spend time alone with you. We worship you. We're thankful for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you Wednesday.